How are we filled with the Spirit? Paul writes this, Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Being drunk with wine and being filled with the Spirit are very similar, because in both cases, we are filled with something that influences us. How are we filled with the Spirit? He says in verse 19, As you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves, singing and making melody to the Lord in your hearts, giving thanks to God the Father at all times and for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we are filled with the Spirit when we gather together and we sing praises to God. When we worship God, we are filled with the Spirit. This is season eight of Guerrilla Christianity. My name is Pastor Brett Walker, and I'd like to thank you for listening to Guerrilla Christianity, an unconventional, no apologies exposition of God's grace from an evangelical Methodist point of view. God's holy word is central to all we believe, so let's get into God's word right now. And now, uh, please remain standing for the reading of God's word from the gospel according to Matthew chapter 25. This is chapter 25, verses 1 through 13. Let us hear the word of the Lord for us today. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgin, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. May God pour out his rich blessing upon this, the reading of his holy word. He may be seated. Uh, This week we're going to be starting a new series based in uh, Matthew chapter 25. For the next three weeks we're going to be looking at Matthew 25. Uh, We are at the end of the liturgical calendar. The, uh, The church calendar begins with Advent and it ends with Uh, the reign of Christ or Christ the King Sunday, which is uh, the last Sunday uh, before Advent. Advent is November 29th. We'll be starting a new new year in the lectionary, year B, which focuses on the Gospel of Mark. We've been in uh, the Gospel of Matthew all this year. And so uh, we're looking forward to that that new uh, year, that new liturgical year on the church calendar. Uh, Now, last Advent, uh, 2019, everybody remember 2019? (laughs) Uh, uh, But last Advent, we asked a question. Uh, We had a series all throughout Advent called, Are We There Yet? Now, everybody remembers uh, when we were either when we were children or when we had children and we went on a long car trip, right? The kids would sit in the back and they would say, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Because we get bored, right? Well, that's how we are as Christians. Sometimes we feel like, you know, are we there yet? Well, the title of this series that we're going to be in for the next three weeks, kind of an awkward title, I, I, I give you, but It's there is now. There is now. Are we there yet? There is now. Okay, we're bringing to a close this liturgical. It's almost like I planned it this way, right? I didn't. But, you know, uh, there is now. It means 
that we are at the cusp of uh, what is coming, of the coming kingdom of God. You know, and, and we've been looking forward to it, just as the Jews were looking forward to their coming Messiah in the time of, of Jesus. And so we uh, have come to a time when we are anticipating the return of Christ. In fact, the season of Advent really looks forward to uh, the return of Christ, not just uh, pre preparation for celebrating his first coming, but anticipation for his next coming, for his return. And so we've already read this uh, text today. It's a parable about the wise and foolish virgins. Uh, let's uh, prepare our hearts and minds to receive this word. Let us pray. Lord, we come seeking wisdom and guidance from your holy word. You speak to us from the pages of the Bible. All scripture is breathed out by your Holy Spirit and is profitable for the men and women of God for instruction, for reproof, for discipline, for training in righteousness, so that we may be ready to do your good work here on earth. Be with us now as we hear your word and may we live it out in the world that you would be glorified and your kingdom be established now and forevermore. This we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Redeemer. Amen. Well, we have uh, seemingly survived election day, or I guess it's now election week, right? It's not just election day. When I was a kid, we used to use election day, you know? You, you, you go down to the polls, you vote, um, the polls close around 8 o'clock, the results start coming in. Usually around midnight, maybe one o'clock in the morning, a winner is declared. Um, the, the one with the, the least electoral votes uh, phones and gives a concession to the winner, right? They make a speech and you go to bed, you know who won. We don't do that anymore, do we? <laughs> no. Uh, you would think with technology, we'd get it better. But anybody remember 2000? Oh my goodness, that dragged on for a month, you know, and lawsuits, and it all came down to Florida and 600 votes and recounts and recounts and recounts, and my goodness. And, and the thing is, the process, the whole process is so painful for people on both sides, not just the people on the losing side, quote unquote losing side, but the, the people on the winning side too. It's just painful. It just, it's just, by the time it's all over, Everybody's just glad it's over, you know? But the thing is, how many, how many of us are really completely focused on who wins and who loses, right? We hang our hopes on one candidate or the other. I know there's more than one party in this nation, but by and large, we are a two-party system, for better or for worse. Now, when our guy wins, we celebrate Right? We, we act like all the ills of the world are going to be fixed tomorrow. When our guy loses, we mourn as if somebody died. Like the world is going to end tomorrow. Why do we place so much emphasis on earthly powers? When our king is sitting on the throne, our king is sitting on the throne. Even now, Isaiah saw it. He saw God seated on the throne high and lifted up. Seated on the throne. Not standing, not wringing his hands, not pacing back and forth, not wondering what the heck's going on. Seated on the throne in full control. Sovereign God, the King of all kings, the Lord of all lords. That's who we ought to be hanging our hopes on not on earthly powers. Yeah, we have governments that we follow, that we obey, but we, we first, our first obedience is to our God, who is our King. What we're talking about here, this is uh, chapter 25, is part of the Olivet Discourse. Now, the Olivet Discourse is not like the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount 
was a sermon that Jesus gave to a lot of people. This is a, a teaching that Jesus is giving directly to his closest disciples. And it starts in chapter 24. Okay? They are in the presence of the temple in Jerusalem. And the disciples are pointing to this temple, which, by the way, this, this temple that they were seeing in, in Jesus' time was brand new. It had that new temple smell. It had just been, it's still under construction, as a matter of fact, by Herod. Uh, not Herod the Great, who was the one who tried to kill Jesus as a two-year-old, but Herod the Tetrarch, who uh, was a son, one of the four sons of Herod, who at this point was a ruler uh, in the region of Galilee and Judea. And he was appointed by Rome. Now, in order to ingratiate himself with the locals, he decides he's going to rebuild their temple and it's going to be splendid. And so the disciples, they see these, these white glistening stones gilded with gold. And, and they look up and they, they say, look at these, these buildings, how wonderful they are. And all these things are giving glory to God. You know, can you think of a better place to worship God? And they were probably earnest. They were probably being, you know, what Jesus said to them is this. You see all these things, very truly I tell you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Whoa, hold on. You know, I mean, the, the, the thing is still being built and he's already talking about its destruction. Now, in fact, history will tell us that the destruction of the temple came in 70 AD when the, when the, the Jews... At the end of the Jewish uprising, the Romans destroyed the temple and threw the stones down. You can go into Jerusalem today and see the place where the stones of the original temple were thrown over the, over the side of the temple mount and broke the pavement underneath. What Jesus was saying was, don't hang your hopes on earthly things. Hang your hopes on something eternal. Every kingdom that has ever existed has gone the way of the dodo, you know? The, the, the nations that we think of today, and many of them have existed for our entire lifetimes, but they really haven't been around very long in the grand scheme of human history, you know? The United States has only been around for what, 240 years, 250 years, just about? 2026 will be 250 years. That's nothing. That is nothing. When we read the history of the, the, the kingdom of Israel, okay, from the time that Moses led them out, from the time that Joshua conquered the promised land, to the time when Babylon carried them off into captivity, was roughly 800 years, okay? And the kingdom of Israel, and they probably all thought that it was going to last forever, and for a lot of people in the middle, it did. But it came to an end. It came to an end. Now, in, during my entire lifetime, the nation of Israel has existed. It was first established in 1948, you know. And I can't think of a time when Israel didn't exist as a nation. But, you know, here's the King James uh, Bible which was translated into English in 1611. And in 1611, there was no nation of Israel. And so they had to figure out where all these things are taking place. It's really hard to imagine, you know? All that to say this, we, we feel like the United States is going to last forever. I can assure you that it will not. And that might be harsh, to say, and I'm not saying it's going to end today or tomorrow or in our lifetime, but it will end one day when Jesus comes back to claim what his is, what is his, all of this is going to be gone. All of this is going to be gone. And that's what Jesus is saying. So he talks about the kingdom of heaven in this parable, chapter 25. 
Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise, and five of them were foolish. So, obviously, from this story, uh, Jesus wants us to be like the wise virgins and not like the foolish ones, right? Okay. So I'm going to give you a list, okay? I don't usually do lists, but in this case, uh, the teaching seemed to lend itself to be a list. So here are five ways to be ready when Jesus comes back. Five ways to be ready when Jesus comes back. Number one, be filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. Verses 3 and 4 says, They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. So in the Bible, the image of oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Okay? When Aaron was anointed as the high priest of Israel, they poured oil over his head. They anointed him with oil. Did the same thing with his sons when, he, when it came time for him to die. Uh, when Samuel, the priest, anointed a king of uh, Israel, anointed Saul, the first king of Israel, poured oil over his head. Same with David. When David was the king, they poured oil over his head. It's a symbol of the Spirit of God being poured out on this ruler. In the case of Aaron, it was the high priest. In the, king of, in this, in the uh, case of Saul and David, it was the king of Israel. But it's anointing of the Spirit, this oil. And so Jesus wants us to be filled with the Spirit. How are we filled with the Spirit? We get this from Ephesians chapter 5 and verses 15 through 20. Paul writes this. Be careful then how you live, not as unwise people, but as wise, making the most of the time because the days are evil. So do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Then he says this, do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, that's a weird juxtaposition, don't you think? But it, it sounds like being drunk with wine and being filled with the Spirit are very similar. They are. Because in both cases, we are filled with something that influences us. You know, when we say we're, we're, when we're drunk, we say we're under the influence right? We're under the influence of the alcohol, okay? And then we do stupid things. And I know this because I've been drunk and I've done stupid things, okay? And Paul says, don't do that. Don't be filled with alcohol. Be filled with the Spirit. And what happens if we're filled with the Spirit? We're under the influence of God's Spirit, how are we filled with the Spirit? He says in verse 19, as you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves, singing and making melody to the Lord in your hearts, giving thanks to God the Father at all times and for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we are filled with the Spirit when we gather together and we sing praises to God. When we worship God, we are filled with the Spirit. See, we are not called to be Christians in isolation. We are called to be gathered together in the body of Christ. And you can't be a part of the body if you are apart from the body. We have, to, we have to gather together. We are filled with the Spirit when we gather together as a body and we sing and we worship and we praise God. That's how we are filled with the Spirit. So the first thing we need to do is we need to be filled with the Spirit. We need to worship God with others. That is where the Spirit is. Jesus said, wherever two or three are gathered together in my name, there I will be among them. And so we sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. You know, uh, we have this hymn book that we, we sing songs from. And I don't know about you, but I, I, I feel the Spirit of God moving in me as we sing. 
And I listen to worship songs all the time. I listen to uh, songs that give praise to God so that I'm filled with the Spirit. You know, I'm the only one who, who drives that truck for Amazon. I have, a, I have my, my radio station is FM2 and preset 6, and that's 106.9, which is uh, K-Love. I love it. I love it. I'm singing songs at the top of my voice. And we have a camera in the cab, and I know they're watching me. And I wonder what they think of me. You know, it's like, there goes, there goes that guy singing all the songs about Jesus again. You know? Well, that's how we're filled with the Spirit. We, we sing songs, but not just by ourselves. We gather together. That's what Paul says. Sing, sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves. Together. Gather together. Singing and making melody to the Lord in your hearts, giving thanks to God the Father at all times and for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the first thing is we need to be filled with the Spirit. We're filled with the Spirit when we worship God with others. Now the second thing is to stay awake. Stay awake. Verse 5 says, uh, While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. Now notice, it's not just the foolish virgins who slept, but it's also the wise ones as well. This is the problem, and this is where we are today. Because the bridegroom has tarried. He hasn't come back yet. And some of us tend to think that maybe he's never coming back, you know? And we start to say things like, oh, well, the, the whole thing about the, the rapture, that's not true. It's not going to happen. And it certainly won't happen in my lifetime. It could happen any time. That's the thing. And I'm not saying that to, to, to put, strike fear in anybody, but so that we can be prepared. You know, I, I, I once told a story about how uh, when my parents went on vacation and left me at home, I, I, I let the house become a, a wreck. I didn't take care of anything. The dishes piled up. The pool in the backyard got green, turned green, right? The, I never mowed the lawn. They came home to like two weeks worth of grass, but they came home a day early. I wasn't expecting it, right? And were they upset? Yes, they were. They were very upset with me. Um, and rightly so, because I wasn't doing what I was supposed to be doing. As Christians, we are called to be ever vigilant, to stay awake. How do we stay awake? You can't stay awake 24 hours a day. Eventually, you'll, you'll become delusional and, and die. Our brains need rest. So in order to stay awake, especially in the night, let me give you a tip because I work at night. I work overnight. I work from 9 p.m. to 7.30 a.m. How, how do you work all night long without feeling sleepy? Well, you get rest. You have to manage your rest. You have to sleep during the day. And so in order to stay awake, we need to rest in the Lord. Rest in the Lord. There's an importance to taking a Sabbath. Rest. There's a reason why it's commanded for us to rest one day in seven. Because God knows that we are stubborn and pig-headed. And we will work ourselves into an early grave if we allow ourselves to. But God in his wisdom tells us to rest one day out of seven. Now, a lot of ink has been spilled about whether that day is Saturday or Sunday. Okay, Christians, yes, we observe the Lord's day on Sunday because that's the day that Jesus rose from the dead. And the, the Jews say, well, but, but the Ten Commandments clearly say, uh, six days shall you work, but the seventh day is a, is a Sabbath day to the Lord. And they point to the creation of the world, of the universe, when God made everything in six days and rested on the seventh day. Okay, that's fine. Personally, I think, and Paul will back me up on this, that the day itself doesn't matter. The reason I say Paul will back me up on this is because he wrote in the book of Galatians, that, you know, some people celebrate, some people observe one day over another, and some people observe a different day. But it's not the day that matters, it's the Spirit. See, those things that, that, that God was pointing to in the Old Testament were shadows of things to come. 
This Sabbath rest is a day that we spend. I think that God will be fine if we spend just one day out of seven resting and focusing on Him. But how many of us really do? If we did, if we just rested one day out of seven and focused on our relationship with God on that day, then I'm pretty sure God doesn't care whether it's Sunday or Wednesday or Friday or Saturday or any other day. As long as there's a day in the week that we rest in the Lord. But we don't. We don't because we look at resting as wasted time. So we need to rest in the Lord. That's how we can stay awake by resting in the Lord. We rejuvenate ourselves. This is what Matthew chapter 26 and verses uh, 40 through 41. Now, Jesus was in a garden of Gethsemane with his three uh, closest friends, Peter, James, and John. And he told them to stay awake with him. And he said, my soul is exceedingly sorrow, sorrowful even to death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. Stay awake. But they couldn't. They were very grievous and they were tired. And so like anybody would, they fell asleep. Then in verse 40, he came to his disciples and found them sleeping. said to Peter, so you could not stay awake with me one hour? Stay awake and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. God knows that we need rest. And so we rest in him so that we can stay awake, stay vigilant. All right. So <clears throat> be filled with the spirit, stay awake. And now this, listen for God's calling. Listen for God's calling. Verse six says, and at midnight there was a cry made. Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Then those, all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. Okay, so <clears throat> how do we listen for God's calling? God speaks to us. How? Through Scripture, through the pages of the Bible, God speaks to us. God inspired the words of the Bible in the hearts of people who wrote them down. And we have this, this is like a love letter to us from God. Why wouldn't we want to read a love letter from God to us? You know, he talks about how, you know, God is merciful and God is forgiving and God is loving. Yes, God is a God of judgment. God is a God of justice. God is wrathful and vengeful, true. But for those who love him, he says, he only gives us two commandments that we really need to follow. He says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. You know, if we did only those two things, everything else would fall into place. So we need to read Scripture. In 2 Timothy, Paul writes to Timothy, he says, All Scripture, all Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. We equip ourselves by reading what God has to say to us. Now, I've tried to make it my uh, endeavor to read through the Bible every year, and I've not done it perfectly every year, but since 2008, I have read through the Bible 10 times, and I'm on my 11th time and getting pretty close to the end now. All that to say, we need to be in God's word. We need to, if we want to know what God is saying to us, if we want to hear his voice, if we want to hear him calling to us, we need to be in his word, okay? So listen for God's calling. Read scripture. So we're going to, we're going to um, be filled with the spirit by being in worship with each other. We're going to stay awake by resting in the Lord. We're going to listen for God's calling by reading scripture. And then this, we're going to trim our lamps, trim our lamps. Number four is trim our lamps. What does that mean? Well, anybody who has ever had a candle knows that it burns better 
if you trim off the burnt end of it every once in a while, right? If you have an oil lamp, you need to trim the wick and get rid of all the burnt parts of it, okay? There's this great hymn that I, I love uh, by Philip Bliss called Let the Lower Lights Be Burning. It's not in our current hymnal. It's in a previous hymnal. It's actually, it's in our tabernacle hymns. I love this hymn. Uh, and Philip Bliss was a nautical gentleman, and he, um, he wrote from imagery of, this, of the sea. And so he wrote about a lighthouse. He said, brightly beams our Father's mercies from his lighthouse uh, evermore. But to us, he gives the keeping of the lights along the shore. And he says, let the lower lights be burning. Send a gleam across the wave. Some poor, fainting, struggling seaman you may rescue, you may save. I like the third verse. The third verse says, trim your feeble lamp, my brother. Some poor sailor tempest tossed, trying now to find the harbor in the darkness may be lost. You see, we can't attract people out of the darkness with darkness. We have to attract people out of the darkness with light. And when we trim our lamps, we have more light. So what is trimming our lamps? Trimming our lamps is cutting out all the burnt parts of our lives. In other words, we need to avoid sin. We need to choose to walk in the way of righteousness and we need to choose to turn away from sin. That's what Jesus' first message was to the people of Israel. After he was baptized in the River Jordan by John the Baptist and the sky opened up and God's voice said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And the spirit of God descended upon him like a dove. And he went out into the wilderness and he fasted for 40 days. He was tempted by the devil. And when he came back, his first message, his first sermon went like this. Repent, for the kingdom of God has come near. That was his message. It's recorded in the pages of the Bible. Repent, for the kingdom of God has come near. What is repentance? Repentance is, I'm walking in the way of sin but I repent of my sin. I turn away from it. I turn completely back to God. I do a 180. That's what repentance is. I say, this is wrong. I'm not doing it anymore. I turn away from it. And now I'm walking in the path of righteousness. God leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. So to trim our lamps is to cut out the burnt parts of our lives or avoid sin. Proverbs chapter 25 and verse 26 says, Like a trampled spring and a polluted well is a righteous man who gives way before the wicked. A righteous man who, 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 who gives into sin. And yeah, we, we struggle. We all struggle with sin. And I'm not saying that any of us is perfect. We, we're not going to be. But increasingly, as we are filled with the Spirit, we are increasingly more and more like Christ. And we, can, and we can and will turn away from our sin much more easily as we walk in those ways. Okay. So the five ways to be ready when Jesus comes back. First, be filled with the Spirit by worshiping God with others. Second, stay awake by resting in the Lord. Third, listen for God's calling by reading Scripture. Fourth, trim your lamps by avoiding sin. And finally this, get to know God. Get to know God. You know, verses 10 through 12 is very sad. Uh, well, they went out to buy, the bridegroom came, and they were, that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Picture the door of the ark. That door was open. That door was open for 120 years while Noah built that ark and preached repentance to the people. And anybody could have gone into that ark at any time. But when the rains came, only Noah and his family went in 
and the door was shut. And that's what happened. That's what he's talking about here. The bridegroom came, they that were ready went in with him to the marriage and the door was shut. Afterward came the other virgin saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. That's a tough word to hear. You see, it's not a matter of whether we know God, it's whether God knows us. Now, God is omniscient. He knows all things. But how do we get to know someone? How do we become familiar with someone? How do we develop a relationship with someone? Through conversation. What do you do when you first start dating a person? You might be attracted to the person physically. And then you, you ask them out on a date. And what do you do? You go to dinner, right? You sit over dinner and you talk. You have a conversation. You tell each other your things that you like and the things that you don't like. And you, you start to build a relationship around those things, those commonalities. It's the same with God. In order to build a relationship with God, we have to talk with God. And how do we talk with God? Through prayer. Through prayer. It's not whether we know God, it's whether God knows us. I thought about this, this, this whole uh, thing down in Washington, you know. It doesn't matter really who the president is. If I go over to the White House and I say, I want to I talk to the president. Well, who are you? I'm a citizen of the United States. I know who the president is. It doesn't matter. He doesn't know who I am. <laughs> And so I don't get let in. It's the same with God. We have to have a conversation with God in order to know Him. We talk to Him. Not just to tell Him things that we want, but, you know, express our fears, our, our desires for life, you know? Talk to God. Pour out our feelings about who we are, who we want to be. Where am I disappointed in my life? Where am I grateful that God has brought me to? You know, all these things, ways that we can pray. And, and the more we pray to God, the more we get to know God. It's often been said that man to be loved must be known, but God to be known must be loved. And how do we express our love with God? If you had a neighbor who only ever came over to borrow your lawnmower, how much do you really know about that person? Other than, you know, he likes to mow his lawn. That's all you really know. But if your neighbor comes over and knocks on your door and says, hey man, let's have a cup of coffee and sit and talk and get to know one another. Then you build a relationship with that person. That person is not just asking for something all the time, but you build a relationship with that person and you get to know them. It's the same with God. Get to know God through prayer. Jeremiah chapter 33 and verse 3 says, Call to me and I will answer you and I will tell you great and mighty things which you do not know. God wants to answer us in prayer. God wants to talk to us in prayer. And remember that prayer is not a monologue. Prayer is a dialogue. Prayer is a conversation between us and God. And we might not hear an audible voice from heaven speaking to us, but we will hear the gentle prodding of our Lord as he tells us in our hearts what he desires for us. So we need to get to know him because otherwise he doesn't know us. And then he ends with this, Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. This is a, a common thread. Uh, he said it in verse uh, 42 of chapter 24, Watch therefore, for ye know not what, the hour, what hour your Lord doth come. We don't know when he's going to return. We only know that he will return. And we know that because he made that promise and he keeps his promises. Every other promise he's ever kept. Why would we think that this one is different? He cannot lie. He tells us that he will return. 
And so my question for you today is that if Jesus were to return today, right now, are you ready? We get so distracted by the things of the world. I have tried so hard this week not to be swept up in a fervor surrounding this election. We focus on these things because we can see them. Like the Israelites cried out to Samuel for a king. We fail to realize that our king is seated on the throne right now. We place our hopes on earthly powers, on electing the right representative to lead us into a better future. What better and brighter future is there for us than the eternal kingdom of God? And Jesus tells us in this parable that there was a shout at midnight proclaiming the return of the bridegroom. You see, midnight is the darkest part of the night when the sun is on the opposite side of the world from us. When it's darkest, when everything seems the bleakest, when it looks like all is lost, that is when Christ shall return with a shout, with the trumpet of God, and everyone will know that he has returned. Will you be ready? Will you be awake? Be filled with the Spirit. Stay awake. Listen for God's calling. Trim your lamps. Get to know God in prayer. Be like the wise virgin, virgins in this story and be ready for Christ's return. We ask, like the petulant children on a long trip, are we there yet? Friends, there is now. Let us remain prepared always to welcome our king into his kingdom. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for reminding us that you are in charge that you are seated on the throne. And we thank you, Lord, for this story, this uh, parable that has been left for us to study. And so we pray, Lord, that you will help us in this regard, that we will be focused on you, that we will be filled with your spirit through worship, corporate worship, singing songs and praising your holy name, that we will be awake that we, will, that we will rest in you. Uh, that we will listen for your calling by reading your holy word. That we will avoid sin in our lives so that our light may burn brightly. And Lord, this is a hard one for us. Help us to be more uh, present in prayer. Help us to remember that you are always listening. And all we have to do is to open our mouths and call out to you. You will hear us and you will answer. Let our prayer be a conversation with you, Lord. And let, let our ears be open to hear what you would have to say to us. In all things, Lord, we give you glory, honor, and praise. And all this we pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Thank you for joining us on this edition of Guerrilla Christianity. My hope and prayer is that this time of listening to and learning from God's Word has blessed you as much as it has blessed me putting this message together. And God has also blessed me in appointing me to serve two churches in Salem County, New Jersey, Ebenezer United Methodist Church in Auburn and Hudson United Methodist Church in Pedricktown. If you don't have a church family to call your own and you live in the area, I'd like to invite you to join us on Sunday mornings. We are a Bible-believing, gospel-preaching, Christ-adoring faith community in the heart of New Jersey's farmland. Ebenezer meets for worship at 9 a.m. and Hudson meets for worship at 10.30. We also have Bible study during the week. Of course, if you don't live nearby, get involved with the church where you are. We are not called to be Christians in isolation, but in community. So I would encourage you to live out your faith with a group of like-minded believers wherever you are. Now, if you enjoy this podcast and would like to help support it, please share it with your friends and family. Hit like, leave a comment, and also subscribe to our YouTube channel. Just search for Guerrilla Christianity. Keep learning, keep growing, and I pray you will join us for Guerrilla Christianity again. Until next time, remember this, Christ died for you. Now go live for Christ.